All right. Oh, it's so nice to feel intellectually inferior. Love it. Love to talk to you, Peter. Uh, so, um, <clears throat> panpsychism. I was going to attack you uh, for uh, defining consciousness too broadly, but then you plastered that hole. <laughs> Sorry. And, <laughs> and then, uh, but uh, there is um, there is something with how we define sentience. I think uh, that I think Alexei was uh, sort of uh, nibbling at, uh, which is that. I wouldn't like to introduce the, the concept of will to power in the Nietzschean sense, but a will to higher uh, levels of complexity for very, very small things like atoms and molecules. Uh, couldn't there be a connection? Uh, because everything that comes into existence seems to want to form higher grades of complexity mm -hmm. in itself for survival or something, right? Yes. And so. Okay, well. Um Interestingly, I got into panpsychism through Nietzsche, believe it or not, because um, I, was, I became very interested in Nietzsche's later work, um, where he starts to develop this theory of the will to power, Willis um, Macht. He writes about it in some published works, like Beyond Good and Evil, 36, and so on, and it's prevalent in his later works. Um, but he, he wrote in The Genealogy of Morality, one of his last books that he was going to publish this book called The Will to Power. It was renamed later to The Revaluation of All Values. But it seems that this was written in uh, the late 80s. In 1889, he went mad, of course, and that was never completed. Of course, a book called The Will to Power was then later released by his sister, and that's a collection of his notes, uh, which perhaps were never intended to be published. But nonetheless, I was looking at those notes, and I was reading about The Will to Power, and it, it seems that um, it was a return to Schopenhauer's will to a certain extent. And Karl Popper called Schopenhauer a uh, Kantian turned panpsychist. It was a return to this notion of will being inherent in all things, um, a panpsychism, in other words, a will panpsychism. But yeah, the difference is that um, whereas Schopenhauer wrote about a will to survive or to live, um, Nietzsche said, advance that into a will to power, by which he meant a will to development. Um, a greater complexity would be a part of that. Um, so, so looking into yeah, Nietzsche's work, and I think that the will to power ha does have this panpsychist element. This is disputed in Nietzschean circles, like Maud Marie Clark uh, argues for a mechanical view of Nietzsche, but you know, it's completely wrong. So, so yes, so, um, and we can discuss that later. But, but um, I mean, in the, in the notebooks, he says, you know, we should understand uh, the will to power as an affect form. In other words, there's an affection, the affectation, you know, an emotion, a feeling, a drive. That underlies all energy. So in that sense, yeah, he is a panpsychist, um, and I've got a lot of sympathy for it, certainly. But when you, when you reduce it down to the, the smallest part, the panpsychist theory, how is it different from religion in saying that all is one? Well, number one, panpsychism needn't be cosmopsychism. So panpsychism, um, per se, doesn't say all is one. Um, Schopenhauer's version does, for another reason. Um, and cosmopsychism does. How is that different from religion? Well, of course, at the cosmopsychical level, they are har in harmony. But I think the general difference is this: that you know, a panpsychological or cosmopsychological point of view is based on reasoning, whether that be inductive or analogical or whatever. Whereas religion generally is based on faith. You know, so you know, you just believe this. You have an intuition or whatever that like Alan Watts said about his experience of the universe as one. I suppose that's the difference. You know, so. You know, a religion might be true or false, um, but it doesn't need to give reasons. It can do, and that's theology, of course. But, um, but I think this is a philosophical doctrine. The religious analogue to panpsychism is probably animism, um, yes. which is a derogatory term. Um, you think? Originally, well, <laughs> I, I mean, it was originally um, coined by Tyler, someone called Tyler, and he, he talked about primitive cultures believing in animism, believing that trees and rivers and mountains had spirits. Um, of course. But now we know it's an inherent human quality, it's a human bias. We all apply animism. We see the man in the moon, we yeah. imagine there is a man in the sea or a, or a girl with a fishtail. Well, children perhaps have this, uh, <laughs> certainly this bias. Um, yeah, no doubt. But it's, I wouldn't call it a religion here. Would you call it a religion? I mean, it's a religion in certain countries, but not, not in the West. Uh, not anymore, no. 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 So, I mean, the difference is this, yeah, you know, it's a belief, you inherit it, you just, you just um, 
you know, define yourself by that belief, that's religion, I suppose, very broadly speaking, whereas panpsychism at least seeks to be, seeks to, to ground it in reasons. And psychedelic intake is not so much reasons, but, you know, adds, as I was saying, it sort of adds to the um, apprehension due to getting rid of the prosaic fallacy that Hartswan talks about and so on. Yes, and I also felt you were a little unfair against Christianity, because I think uh, when it comes to religious persecution of panpsychists, uh, I mean, the Catholic Church at the height of its power had ample reason, but I mean, if you look at uh, Saul of Tarsus, what's his name, Paulus? Is that uh, Saul of Tarsus? Anyone know their New Testament? Obviously not in this crowd. <laughs> uh, so... <laughs> um, uh, Saul. Saul. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. Is that his name? Saint yeah. Paul. Uh, say, yes, yes. Him. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Right. He wrote the Bible and so on. Yeah. 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 Because yeah. he. Then, uh, I mean, if you look at uh, him as the first apostle, he said uh, that we should carry the spirit of the word forward and not the actual word, because you can, you know, use that book. Uh, yeah. I mean, uh, it's. it's um, the, there was word. The, the word. Um, some people say Aristotle was a panpsychist because he used the word um, pneuma. And it wasn't the same psyche um, or anime, but it was, um, it was a sort of, a, it, was related, it was translated as breath in the Old Testament, or spirit, the Holy Spirit, you see. So there is um, a fusion of panpsychological thinking from ancient Greece into the uh, Jewish translation of the Hebrew Bible, the Old Testament, and then, and then um, of course, yeah, the New Testament is in Greek anyway. Yeah, because in, in Judaism, Judaism, there are certain sects, I suppose you could call them, who believe that, you know, God is everything. So, and th that's a panpsychist idea, I suppose. Or pantheist, yeah. Yeah. I mean, you can be a panpsychist and be um, a complete atheist, really. You know, because, you know, um, most panpsychisms stop at the sort of uh, human level, and they would not bequeath sentience to a planet or a sun or the universe. Um, and... Uh, you can take that view and, and call yourself an atheist and a secularist. There's no contradiction there. I suppose that when you talk about if the, whole, if the whole universe had its own subjectivity, then that would pretty much be God. So then you'd have to admit some kind of atheism, yeah. But you needn't. It needn't be religious. It needn't be... A, it can be a secular view. So, yeah, well, um, if you agree that molecules would have a will to higher grades or orders of complexity, then... Uh, in the end, if you take it all the way out, the universe would be a very complex organism in itself. Well, that's the question. How, how far do you extend it? You know, so Fechner extended, extended this view upwards. But um, the real question is, you know, what are, the, um, what are the necessary substrates of sentience as one unit? You know, and this is unknown. Um, of course, we have the neural correlates to a certain extent. Um, but because of multiple realization, we realize that that's not... Uh, although that's sufficient, it's not necessary. You could have other substrates which could create the same uh, sentience. Not create, I should say, should correlate to the same sentiences. So do you think that uh, humans having attained consciousness, we are actually apart from nature? And that all of the rest of nature is a panpsychist sort of... No, I'd, I'd say we are, we are you know, at a high, le high level of complexity of nature. That's um, mirrored in our body and our, and our sentience. But we are part and parcel of the, it's the same principle in the human, in a mouse, and in a virus. All right. And uh, I wanted to take up one last point that I remember just now is uh, Henry James. William uh, James' brother. Yes. Uh, wasn't their father uh, Swedenborgian? Swedenborgian, yeah. Yes. Yeah. So he was sort of a, because that's sort of a pan psychist religion, um. isn't it? <laughs> I, ha I, okay, <laughs> d d I th I'm not a S Swedenborgian specialist, but Kant wrote a book about him, Dreams of a Spirit, here, which I've read, and I've read Heaven and Hell by him. But he seems to me a Jew seems to me to be a dualist, Swedenborg. You know, so he believes that um, our human consciousnesses can exist without the body. You know, to go to heaven and hell. Panpsychists won't. You know, well, there are many varieties, but generally, a panpsychist will say, when the human body is dead, that's it for that particular sentience. Then we break down into the smaller sentiences, as it were. But there's no life after death, necessarily, although there are certain panpsychists who will make, could argue for it, Fechner did, for example. But um, it, it's not necessary. So again, that's how panpsychism is not a religious view of necessity. 
Because um, <clears throat> I had a DMT trip a few years ago uh, where uh, I met a lot of small things that, you know, my animistic self would, uh, would see as sort of a Keith Haring-like characters. Uh, yeah, well, it's quite obvious what he had done before he found his voice as an artist. Um, but as I see it, being, you know, a super reductionist, um, I see it as all my sensory organs breaking down. I can see the neurons trying to communicate what they want for, from me. Mm -hmm. uh, it could be, but I mean, again, the, the problem is, is the ultimate deep question of, okay, you're, I'm not, I mean, obviously certain um, visions on psychedelics are related to brain, brain activity, no doubt about it. But the question is, um, what is that relationship anyway, you know, between the mind and matter? And that's uh, not determined. And you know, I'm sympathetic to the idea that this, uh, these eternal objects do exist. Um, you know, everything we see is actually an inference, a sort of ingression, as Whitehead calls it, from this third realm. Um, but we only see that which is practical to us. So, therefore, um, with a breakdown of that practical functioning, uh, we do access this greater realm. Something that Gödel believed in, interestingly, Kurt Gödel. You know, he um, it's related to artificial intelligence because uh, he, he claimed that he wouldn't have come up with his incompleteness theorems if he did not believe in this third realm. And moreover, the incompleteness theorems um, led him to that view f furthermore. And Roger Penrose, whom I mentioned, he, uh, he argued that uh, robots or computers will never attain consciousness because of Gödel's uh, incompleteness theorems, which were based on the belief in the reality of this third realm. So. Because that's how I understood you when we talked this summer, when we touched upon panpsychism just briefly at the end of our conversation, that we were just basically antennas receiving a, a larger consciousness through mm. ourselves. Yeah. You know, the man without a brain? Yeah, yeah, yes, yes, Lorber, yeah. Um, <laughs> well, a Lorber student. Um, yeah, well, that's a Bergsonian view, yeah. Um, it's. Um, with regard to this, I'm not saying I, I take any firm view, right? <laughs> um, so I'm not going to make the case. I mean, I've got sympathies for Bergsonism, that yes, the brain is simply a receiver of something out there already, and I do believe there's something out there already, but at the same time, um, there are problems with that, obviously, and I'm undecided, you know, this is, uh, this is the truth, you know. Well, it is kind of but a hard... I'm undecided, but I realize, you know, what has flaws, and the, the traditional view of the mind and brain, I think it's deeply flawed. So I can reject that. I think panpsychism is the most logical explanation, but it's got issues as well. And when you get into the third realm aspect of it as well, then it gets very contentious. So um, I think, uh, you know, the more I read, the more I realize that, you know, we really know very little about this whole thing about sentience. You know, we think we create models and whatever, but they always reach these paradoxes, contradictions, or impasses. And that's why you have to open up, you know, um, that's why panpsychism is becoming a prevalent view again in the last 15 years, because, okay, maybe we should re-explore this old theory about how mind and matter relate. But then you have to sort of, you have to sort of leave metaphysics and go into religion, because you have to invent some sort of life force, don't you? I don't think so. I mean, I think, re like, with regard to the abstraction argument, I think it's, it's uh, informative to think of our notion of matter energy. When you talk about reduction, you're talking about reduction to the matter energy, which is a common concept that we have today. But then, you, like I was saying, you look at the history of that, we see that that notion is constantly being augmented. You know, it's evolving. You're know, adding uh, properties to matter which we had no idea in the past. When you talk about, for example, um, properties in quantum physics to someone 100 years ago, they would have thought that's completely religious, magical. Um, but now we accept it. Uh, well, people do generally. And um, there's no reason to believe that matter as we know it today is absolute. The reason for that is ultimately because, yeah, it does not explain sentience. You know, we cannot get a proper view of reality without the integration of sentience into our overall ontology, our worldview. Do you have any questions, or should I? I was wondering if uh, you'd like to elaborate a bit on the distinction between uh, panpsychism and panprotopsychism. It, it seems uh, like a relevant question in light of the, what was, what was the phrase, the, the eternal battle between uh, emergentism and panpsychism. You sort of touch on some of the yeah. philosophical foundations of both of those positions. Okay, well, um, the difference is this, that panpsychism believes that um, matter and mind are 
essentially one thing, and we understand them as two things by artificially abstracting them. Whereas pan-proto-psychism um, is the view that mind and matter are both um, emergent out of something which is neither of the two. It's not mind, it's not matter. It's a neutral substance. That's why this is also known as neutral monism. A lot of people read Russell in this, in this, in this view, and uh, it's an interesting point of view, but Galen Strawson, who's probably the most prevalent analytical philosopher on uh, panpsychism, he's got a problem with it because ultimately, yeah, it is emergence, you know. From something which is not mental, you get the emergence of something mental and physical. But then you've got this, if one of the main arguments for panpsychism is anti-emergentism, the genetic argument, then you've got this issue. Well, you, you've got emergentism again, you know, here. So this is not a helpful um, alternate. But people are looking into it. There's a lot of research on it at the moment, conferences and so on. But I personally think, yeah, no, it's, it's you know, the problem of emergence then re-emerges. So. Yes, because I don't, still don't really see how they are mutually exclusive, emergence and panpsychism. Well, it's because... Um, because either way you, you divide it, you have to come down to a point where they either come to, into existence simultaneously or they grow, or, yeah, some, yeah. The growth of matter, the evolution of matter into, you know, mo atoms, molecules, planets, galaxies, and so on, is concomitant, concurrent with uh, the evolution of mind, right? So they are always together, because, like I say, ma I emphasize this point, our notion of matter, matter energy, as we'd call it today, is an abstraction. It's not a real thing. It's a logical construction. Um, it does not, it would be, very uh, presumptive to think that we've now attained what you know knowledge of what matter actually is, right? Um, so the argument from the panpsychist point of view is this: if emergentism fails for the reasons given, like mental causation, um, the fact that we've got no scientific laws, transordinal nomology, to explain how mind could emerge from matter, you know, there's just there's no. It's not a scientific view, emergentism, by the way. It's a materialist view. It's not scientific. Um, is it not more parsimonious, more plausible to say, okay, we can't explain how emergentism works at all. Um, therefore, let's say that the mind didn't emerge, right? Now, what does that imply? If the mind did not emerge, then it always existed. And if it always existed, it didn't only exist on us humans, it must, have, it must predate us humans as well, and that's panpsychism then, because it must have existed in pre-organic uh, molecules and whatnot. God, it's impossible to nail you. <laughs> <coughs> So this parsimonious nature, is that something that's ubiquitous also in materia? Or? Um, pass, well, I suppose it's rather that the... It's Can you repeat it? The parsimonious nature, is that, is that ubiquitous in... Well, the parsimony, which means um, using as few axioms as possible to explain something, you know, a more aesthetic kind of, as mathematicians and scientists always... It's more parsimonious to think that um, mind and matter are one thing than to think they are two things that somehow interact in whatever way emerge or have a downward causation or whatever they may be. So the parsimony lies in the fact that you need... F you, but it's more of a monism, you know? You're saying that there's not mind and matter. These are just our human constructions. There is mind matter, as it were, mind dust, mind stuff, as some panpsychists say. Um, and, and that is the concrete reality. But from that concrete reality, we create... We come up with these concepts and so on, you know, which is the advance of science. But um, like I say, this is an inheritance at the moment. It's an inheritance probably from Descartes. We think of matter simply in mechanical terms. Descartes was a mathematician, of course, and so he you'd like, like to think of the world as completely sufficiently describable in terms of uh, extension, space, right, and time. Um, therefore, denied sentience in other beings, except for humans, and this is a legacy that we live with. But like I say, although it's... I think there's another reason for the, um, the for, forsaking of panpsychism is this. This worldview, mechanism, um, or materialism, or whatever you may call it, is very practical, it's very useful, because we create technology, all this technology is created uh, you know, on the basis of that being the case, you know? Uh, the laws of nature as we understand them. You know, it's, it's been very influential in the industrial age, in the information age now, and so we think, well, it works, you know, it explains so much, so surely then it can explain everything. But of course, 
I, I say, no, it can't. You know, it's got its limit. It's useful, but that doesn't mean it's re therefore true. You know, it's got its limitations. People used to believe Newtonian physics. I mean, Kant, Kant believed that Newton discovered the laws of nature. That was it, you know. Um, and uh, that worked. You know, we created uh, satellite systems based on that, really. Um, but then, of course, there were certain things it didn't explain. You know, like uh, the perihelion of Mercury didn't explain that. People didn't really bother people to think, yeah, but it must fit in somehow in the future. Someone will work it out. And I think that's the state we're in with sentience and, and, uh, and the laws of nature today. You know, we think, yeah, we, there are problems with like emergentism or identity theory and so on. Oh, well, we'll sort it out under this general framework. But, I, but my point is that, no, look, this is one of those anomalies that disproves the whole thing. Even though it's uh, useful, it's, it cannot be comprehensive. You know? So in the future, we'll see the sort of the joining, I think, of physics and psychology. This will have an overall more explanatory. Um, this will be a better, superior ontology. Because, um, it was Descartes who, who um, also said that the magpie had a soul. Well... So, because, because the, well, before, yeah, before, no, 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 uh, I didn't, did I say that? Uh, uh, well, I, I, I thought it was interesting because the European magpie is one of the few species on planet Earth that passes the mirror test of consciousness. Mm. It recognizes mm, itself in the mirror. Right. Descartes said that magpies had feelings uh, in passing in a letter. And, uh, and this goes against what he said before, that all animals are automatons. And... Um, um, Cottingham, I think, wrote a paper on this saying, you know, ultimately Descartes confused, you know, contradicts himself. And, um, but the stereotype is that he thought all of, the, uh, all of the natural world was mechanical and that's his famous substance dualism. So that is his main, um, that is his main contention. But the problem, of course, is, you know, like, I mean, I think it's, it would be hard to deny that magpies have a form of sentience, especially when you see behavior like that. It's very hard to deny that. So... But that doesn't make sense in Descartes' whole scheme, you see. So he's using sort of common sense, sort of uh, contradicted his, uh, his uh, philosophical system. And in the end, yeah, it was just left like that. But again, it's a sign that the whole system was flawed. But what do you think about a mirror test as a proof of consciousness? I don't think it's proof of consciousness because you could, you could program a robot to be able to recognize itself in a mirror. But at the same time, uh, that robot needn't be sentient. So it's like the Turing test. Turing himself didn't think this was a test of sentience, but his followers did. So if you don't know the Turing test, it's this, that you, know, you write you know, questions to a computer screen and you get replies. And you, if you can't judge whether those replies are um, uh, automated, machine-like, or whether they're humans, then um, you've reached a stage where artificial... Where, where computers have attained consciousness, I think that's completely wrong because, you know, you can sim there's a massive difference between simulating consciousness, this is what John, John Searle, the American philosopher, always brings out, there's a massive difference between simulating con consciousness and recreating consciousness. So I don't think this is at all a uh, good proof of, of, of consciousness, really. We've, uh, you've talked a lot about the, uh, the limits of materialism, as it were, up until now. Uh, but, of course, the other extreme end of the, the spectrum of uh, opinions is straight up idealism, which you say that you uh, dabbled in in one point. <laughs> so I was wondering if you'd like to uh, tell us more about the process in which you decided that panpsychism was more a uh, reasonable, a more uh, reasonable school of thought to uh, yeah, okay, to, to identify with. Uh, yeah, okay, right. Um, so I was, I would call my a few a number of years ago I would would have called myself a Schopenhauerian, you know, because reason being studied Kant at university, I studied Nietzsche at university. I didn't study Schopenhauer at university, but he's the obvious bridge. He's the bridge between the two. And really, to understand Nietzsche, you need to have read Schopenhauer, I now realize. But anyway, I really got into him because, um, in one sense, he was um, as inspirational as Nietzsche. In another sense, he became almost as technical as Kant. So for me, that's the ideal. You know, you sort of a mixture between this great um, inspiring passion, but also the logical reasoning there. And his famous book is called The World is Will and Representation, um, which then inspired Nietzsche, as I was saying. But, but uh, what brought me away from this really was reading Whitehead. So Schopenhauer, Nietzsche then Schopenhauer got me into panpsychism, and I was seeing, it, seeing the um, positives of it. But then I read, but then, you know, um, a lot of, I was reading years ago now, you know, people saying, Whitehead, he's, he's the shit. You know, he's, he's the main panpsychist thinker, the most systematic thinker. So I thought, okay, I better get into this guy. And I did. And then he had arguments against rep, um, idealism, which changed my view, actually, then. The main, 
the, the main reason was this, that um, like, like most materialisms, idealism believes that what we see is a representation of reality, you know? So our brains somehow conjure up an image of the world around us, you know? And then the question is, yeah, but that does, does that, is that representative of reality as it is in itself, you know? And this is a, then we get questions about naive realism and so on, um, and solipsism and whatnot. And uh, yeah, you know, this is an interesting question then. But then Whitehead said, well, we're, we only, we, in believing that, you are assuming that when you perceive something, that perception is not part of the object perceived. So for Whitehead, um, when you see something, that is causality. You know, it gets deep, but for Whitehead, perception and causality are the same thing. When you see something, that, that thing... Uh, right, so um, he's a process philosopher, so there are no such thing as things. There are processes. Like a star is, okay, a spherical ball of fire or whatnot, but also the, the, the light that emanates from a star is part of that star. It, you know, it, it's only language which distinguishes it. You know, there's a star and there's a light that's, that comes out of it as if it's two things. Really, it's one process. But even more than that, that, that process of starlight hitting your retina, going into your brain, changing your, your, you know, the activity, the process which you yourself are, leading to you you'd say something like, look, a star, um, that is all one big process. And so the perception is not like a representation necessarily of the star out there, but that a part, not whole, a, a small part of that star becomes part of you because it's just one long process, you see. So that's what really took me out of idealism, this view that representationalism is a non-process view of philosophy. It's uh, a really belief in like subjects and objects as if they're uh, separate things, whereas this is a trick of language, ultimately. But, but would a, a non-representational idealism then, in essence, be the same as a panpsychism? Yeah, okay, so if you have a non-representational idealism, I mean, you could hardly call it idealism because it means like ideaism, everything's an idea. But, um, yeah, no, I, you could, I suppose you could have, um, you could have like, um, you can say in panpsychism that everything we see around us is our biased view of perception, you know, like, so everything we see now, it's that small slit of electromagnetism which makes the colors for us. There, are, there is much more out there. We can't see a lot of stuff, gravity, whatever. Um, so um, our view of the world is fractional. It's a perspective of what's out there. And like I was saying before, it's that which is useful to us as human beings. You know, we've evolved to perceive that which is useful to us. Other organisms will perceive other things, deer, bees, ultraviolet, and so on and so forth, right? So I suppose in that sense, you could say that the world you see around you is a, like a representation of reality, but actually re reality is much bigger than that. So, okay. You know, if you can swing language that way, yeah. But I like, you know, generally speaking, though, I'd say it's uh, incompatible. I just had a, maybe a slightly more narrow question. Um, the slide about sentience, the different aspects about sentience, of, of sentience, uh, the uh, conceptual or the uh, information processing the or cognitive side, cognitive side of it uh, versus the experiential side. Uh, the the phenomenal side, yeah. Do you, do you think that they, I mean, it seems reasonable to assume that they, uh, from an evolutionary standpoint, that they co-evolve, that you probably won't find one without the other. Um, but then computers seem to be doing a lot of information processing and reasoning without the experiential side, or? Well, uh, I'd say this. I, d I don't think they co-evolved. I think um, that part of consciousness, concepts and, and reason, is a late is a later aspect of higher consciousnesses. For example, I don't think um, I don't think a virus will have concepts. I think it will. No, have... No, I reacted to that as well. Yeah, agree, right. Yeah. So, so that's what I mean. So it's you can have a thesis, as it's known, you know, phenomenal consciousness uh, without concepts. With regard to computers having, I don't quite get your point there. So computers. Can no, you repeat I, that? I think in nature it seems safe to assume that the different. These two different aspects uh, co-evolve, or that they oh, coincide. Oh, right, that's what you meant, right? Okay, uh, yeah, yeah. But uh, uh, obviously, computers are created by man, uh, but they seem to be doing a lot of information processing, and we can't quite be sure whether they have <clears throat> some inner experience. 
You know, I mentioned um, integrated information theory, um, which is a sort of right. neuroscientific uh, version of panpsychism. I've read Christoph Koch's um, autobiography, uh, and he writes, you know, I admitted to myself recently that I am a panpsychist. You know, <laughs> he had to admit that to himself. But he, I mean, they take it very far. They attribute, because they, talking about the criteria of consciousness, they talk about um, it being based on the amount of in integrated information, you know. So in that sense, you know, we have a lot of integrated information, but a plant does as well, so it's got a low level of sentience. Perhaps a planet, they don't, I don't think they dare to talk about that, but the implication is there. Um, the question is, but they and they will say, yeah, well, actually, we can't deny it to a mobile phone either. Right? And this is where I would differ from them. Um, because it seems to me that, from a Whiteheadian point of view, an organism is part and parcel of its past. You know, its present state is legacy of its past, which goes through evolution. You know, And um, a mobile phone or a machine has not evolved, so it lacks that. But... I must admit that the question whether we will be able to create um, artificial consciousness, not there's a difference between intelligence and consciousness, right? Very important that a lot of people miss, you know, that um, a computer can be very intelligent and can work things out, facial recognition, whatnot. That doesn't mean it's conscious of it. It can be completely automated. Um, the, the interesting question then is whether you can get a conscious machine. Um, and I'm open-minded about that. I, I, um, I mean, I'm open to the possibility, but... How would you ever know? Because even, I mean, this is the whole problem about proof in terms of mind matter theories. You know, if like if you take a Blade Runner, whatever, and you talk about these um, replicants, whatever they're called, um, you know, you can do a test on them and and so on. But even then, I mean, like you could imagine conceptually, like a robot could be very, very. I mean, it's an extension of the Turing test. You can create a robot which fully human-like, you know, um, and they could be extremely subtle in facial expressions, whatever, that still doesn't logically imply that they are conscious. They could be very, very good replicators, simulations. But, but then I'm not, I'm not saying it's impossible either. Um, just the, the integration seems like the central point. Yeah. In, in integration. Yeah. That's right. Integration, when you see a physical system that's integrated, that seems to suggest the sentience attributed to it. One thing I didn't mention, which is very important, a lot of people you know, quickly um, reject panpsychism because they say, oh, so you think tables and chairs are conscious, right? But modern panpsychists don't think that at all because these are not integrated systems. You know, these are man-made artificial conceptions. We would not attribute a consciousness to the table as such or the chair as such. We would only attribute it to the self-sufficient autopoietic systems within the table, i.e. the molecules, which have a very mild basic form of sentience but not the table. Um, it's, and that's the different, difference between the living and the dead. You know, a living body will have an integrated process of information. A dead body will not. That process has stopped, and so then the sentiences dissipate into the, what, what then becomes autopoetic, which will be you know, ultimately the molecules and so on. Um, yeah, so, 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 so obviously that criteria I was talking about um, involves integration. But then the point of panpsychism is that there is integration at all levels of nature anyway. Right, so I think relating to that, it feels a little bit to me, and perhaps you can explain to me why it's not like that. <laughs> um, passive that, aggression there. Exactly, yeah. <laughs> uh, well, no, it's, it's, it's not passive, it has agency, and that's the problem. Okay. Um, so um, we have sentience in everything, but it seems that in order to explain where agency arises, it mustn't there be some sort of emergentism? By agency, you're talking about freedom. Well, freedom or an agency or the will to do anything, or at, I mean, at the pinnacle of that than being consciousness. Mm -hmm. Well, um, it depends what panpsychist you look at. But for example, Whitehead, then, who's my main emphasis at the moment, he says that um, there is agency in all what he calls actual entities, and that's the fundamental sentient units, so an electron is a city of these. Um, but an, an electron, um, an, art, an actual entity, or an actual occasion, or an occasion of experience, all synonyms, more or less, um, they all have agency in that sense. They all have what he calls a subjective aim. They have an aim to create um, a unified whole um, through prehensions. But that 
but ultimately the point is, without getting technical in the whitehead, the point is that yes, no, agency is universal. It's, it's in the minutest of um, subjective units. So all agency has a quality. It is an agency to something. Uh, it, it is, I mean, agency cannot be general. Agency must be pointed. Intentional, you mean? And it, well, not only intentional, but it must have a direction. It, 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 it cannot be a general agency to X. Uh, agency must be an agency to something. So in other words, final cause, a telos. Uh, right, uh, right, exactly. Yeah. So, so then my question to you is, why is it not then the agency in and of itself mm. that is the central unit? In a way, it is for Whitehead. I mean, like I was saying, the subjective aim in Whitehead's actual entity is a, um, an, a, is a telos, like a final cause, and it aims at something that, that Whitehead calls satisfaction or completion of the actual entity, and then it moves on. And um, ultimately, that satisfaction is for Whitehead now, getting somewhere else, but that's an aesthetic appreciation. So at the fundamental level of reality, um, we have these agencies which are always aiming at aesthetic appreciation ultimately don't always succeed but um, this is the um, factor in at the basis of reality which then later on explains appreciation of art which can't it's very hard to explain why we ex why we um, appreciate uh, like the beauty uh, from a mechanistic point of view the basic way obviously is saying like well you know we value beauty because we value beauty in for a perspective mate because we'll have healthy children blah 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 Okay, but that doesn't explain beauty in music at all, or in landscapes necessarily, or in uh, poetry and whatnot, right? So, again, a bit like the emergence of mind from matter, um, this mechanistic theory, which is, again, the legacy, legacy of Descartes, um, reaches another anomaly, another impasse. So, so that then explains why we appreciate art, well, with a few additional books on top of what I said, and also, um, how agency, yeah, is ubiquitous. It's everywhere. So the appreciation is the point. It, 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 essentially, the, it, the art appreciates itself, <laughs> you, could yeah. all, you could almost say. Um, yeah, except I don't, with Whitehead, he does bring in God here. So, um, <laughs> so I don't want to go there because, you know, it conflicts with my Nietzscheanism. Um, but, uh, yeah. but ultimately, God is both transcendent, so he's in that third realm, Called the primordial nature of God, and he is um, pantheistic in the sense that he, he experiences everything that we experience, or it, whatever, um, and not only us, but all, all organisms, which is for Whitehead is, includes molecules. So for Whitehead, there's no distinction between the organic and inorganic. Um, this is, again, another artificial dichotomy. Um, but yeah, so there is that aspect of Whitehead, the sort of theological part, which I try to avoid. But... Uh, to answer your question fully, you need to look into that. Yeah. That's too bad, because you brought <laughs> up uh, Bertrand Russell, uh, who has uh, certain problems with mysticism, and so do I. Because I find when you, uh, when you uh, go into the mystics, you uh, enter a relative universe where good and evil doesn't exist, which I think you sh could appreciate being a Nietzschean. Mm. Good and evil are human concepts, are they not? So this is a very interesting point, and... Um, the, 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 the nature of morality and psychedelic experience or mystical experience. Um, I'd say that most thinkers, most people think that a psychedelic experience brings them morality. You know, it, I mean, for example, in my case, I certainly appreciate nature more. I have much more valuation of nature, nature, not nature, <laughs> after psychedelics. Um, well, nature as well, actually. There you go. So both, both nature and nature, you know, from psychedelics. But, yeah. The question is this, okay, but that's a feeling. That's not necessarily morality per se. That might be considered sentimentalism from another morality. And, um, you know, something that um, Octavio, Octavio Paz writes, he was a Nobel laureate who wrote about psychedelics and Nietzsche in the 60s, 50s, 60s. He wrote that, um, yeah, psychedelics take you away. You know, you look at your society and you laugh at all the silly rules and um, uniforms and ways of life, customs. You know, you... You get an outside perspective, and that's how psychedelics and Nietzsche are similar, because they give you that outside perspective. And of course, for Nietzsche, that includes morality as part of the customs. And so Octavia Paz and uh, Bertrand Russell, yeah, they say, yeah, you know, um, it also takes you outside of morality. Even for Whitehead, he said, you know, importance transcends morality, logic, art, and religion. You know, there's, there's something more there. 
Um, so I think I, I would say this, that, yeah, no, it can certainly foster um, an appreciation of nature, which would be useful, for example, for an ecological morality. But at the same time, you can place that type of morality in a subjective um, Nietzschean realm, you know, that um, it's not absolute, it's not objective, it's not like we therefore have to. There's no moral absolute to say that we must do that, but rather it just um, pushes you that way naturally. And you would, you'd want to do it, you know, but nonetheless... I think that it can take you out of your society and, and um, make you realize that all these beliefs you formerly had are actually just uh, inculcated. Yeah but, that's, and so on. yeah, but that's the thing, because uh, I've met you a few times now, and I know you're a pretty good-hearted person, whereas I see death and destruction everywhere. <laughs> so if I take this <coughs> LSD or something and enter a relative universe or see the universe and the planet as one organism... I can, uh, you know, justify my will to destroy my will f to destroy things mm. uh, by saying I am just a natural part of the order. I am the destructive part of the force. And also, you can say death is not meaningless. You know, this is another mystical thing. You know, I mean, the whole thing about the Eleusinian mysteries was it prepares you for death. You no longer fear death after you've become an initiate. Um, you've experienced that. That mystery in Greece, and I think that's quite common as well. So, therefore, what does it matter if you kill a lot of people and whatever, right? You can go that way. Uh, I don't think a lot of people do go that way, but, um, but at the same time, I think, um, you know, these drugs don't have the same effect on the same people. So they have different effects on different people, and uh, there's no one right way. I mean, I remember Andy Roberts writing about how LSD was used by uh, football hooligans, you know, and to make them a bit more, you know, uh, greater at fighting, you know, when they need to be, you know. It can lead to this. I think what happened historically, though, is that um, in the 60s, um, psychedelics and a sort of um, New Age left ideology married. But, and that, thus we get this view that psychedelics uh, is married to this sort of left-wing ideology. But if you look before that in history, I mean, Ernst Jünger, who was a Nazi and so on, he was... You know, Albert Hoffman wrote, devoted a whole chapter to him in his book, LSD, My Problem Told. He, he thinks that you shouldn't give psychedelics to people and uh, it's too dangerous and, and um, the truths are too profound and so on. Um, so, so I'd, yeah, I, I, I would say that psychedelics are mind expanders and certainly won't therefore pigeonhole you in any particular, whatever it may be, in any particular ideology. And then you end up in relativism or yeah, no, yeah, the abyss. Yeah, that's where, that's where I am, yeah. It's a hard life, yeah. Mm. But while we're on the subject of, of mysticism, I'd like to, uh, to highlight a, a common feature of mystical experiences that may or may not uh, be in conflict with uh, the sort of the, at least the process uh, philosophical variety of panpsychism. That's, I mean, particularly in the, in the so-called Eastern traditions, but I mean also in Oops. Christian mystical traditions as well, I mean. Even there, one sort of the deepest level of a mystical experience can often be something which is described as a form of a pure consciousness without any, well, without any object of consciousness. Really, it's just sort of a consciousness in itself, without any intentionality, without any mm. content. Really, mm. now that seems to uh, contrast quite starkly with the sort of the process philosophical view of consciousness, where there's always a re relationality. There's always a, a form of intentionality in the very... Yeah. You don't agree. Would yeah. you like to...? Um, hmm. <laughs> okay. Is it a very interesting point. Um, for those of you who don't know, uh, Franz Barantano, 100 years ago or so, came up with this idea of intentionality, which actually means that um, the distinguishing feature of consciousness is that it's always about something. You love something. You think about something. Um, you feel about something, and and this does not is not a property of matter. And this is a fundamental distinction. Um, now, I disagree with that. I think that it can be an aspect of consciousness, intentionality, and it's quite common, but it needn't be. You know, like I was talking about um, esthesis, which is the opposite of access consciousness. You can, or the subconscious, if you believe in that. I mean, Brentano actually argued against the existence of the subconscious for this reason. But if you believe in the subconscious, then yes, you have. Um, you have objects like, you know, colors or whatever, but um, you don't think about them. They are just there per se, as it were, right? And um, certainly Whitehead allows for this as well. Um, 
And he's, of course, known as the father of process philosophy. So I don't think that it does really... Dis I, uh, number one, it's very interesting that the report of this experience um, happens because that would seem to refute Brentano's view of intentionality. So consciousness doesn't have to have that. That's something, and that's how, again, psychedelics is important for a philosophy of mind. Seems like introspective refutation. Um, but secondly, I don't think it is um, in conflict with uh, process philosophy. Like I said, I, th I think uh, intentionality is not a necessary aspect of process philosophy. But that's a big, big debate. Yeah, hello, hello everyone. Uh, thank you for organizing this this uh, event. It's really nice to have such an interesting topic uh, on board. It's been a big part of my life as well, thinking about this subject. Um, yeah, so the way you describe panpsychism, which I'm certainly very sympathetic to, is is quite as some other people has also recognized this recognized quite coherent with the kind of emergencies because it still requires some kind of criteria in order for a process to be sort of centered around the subject, right? So there's information integration, could be that kind of criteria, or it could be some, some other kind of principle. And I would especially like to, to bring up uh, a certain research called Carl Friston. I'm not sure if anybody has heard about Carl Friston. Uh, he's a neuroscientist who, who became famous uh, during the last years for a theory called free energy principle. And it's not related to free energy in, in the sort of stupid way, okay? So it's just a sort of a very mathematical global brain theory about like how uh, biological systems in general tend to organize themselves like on a sort of almost physical but still emergent level. I have a hard time really understanding this theory, so that's why I'm also asking if anybody else wants to help me, but it seems to be uh, a really good candidate for consciousness as well, and he seems to believe in it, although he's quite humble in, in, in the, that opinion, but I think everybody should look into that because it's, it's like an organizing principle like similar to information integration uh, that sort of could explain the center of our being, but also be the center of any kind of process, really. So it could be panpsychist in that sense as well. Oh, yeah. Okay, interesting. Yeah. I'll look into it. I'm yeah. it. Yeah. But, but it, it, uh, if I can just shortly try to <laughs> explain it, the idea is sort of in the center of the mind and in the center of any kind of maybe integrated process of some sort, there is a kind of want to, to remove the free in informa the free information or the free energy in the system and and also to sort of always come up with with situations in perception that sort of uh, are as close as possible to your predictions so sort of Bayesian system if you know bias the theorem and and uh, we also sort of create situations in a sense to to make our predictions true <laughs> So we, not only our emotions and our perceptions and everything, everything feeds into our sort of confirmation bias would sort of lie at the, at the heart of, of consciousness even, if right. this would be true. Yeah. Okay, interesting. Yeah, no, I'll look into that. Yeah. But, 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 but the general sort of question for you would be like, what, what is your thought about this sort of boundary of consciousness? Because if, if, you, if you are a panpsychist, which I am as well in a sense, but still a question of where does it, like, my consciousness doesn't feel infinite in some sense. Like I can think about something quite deeply, but there's still sort of a limit always. Mm. And uh, yeah. Well, this is the um, the big unknown. I mean, if you're talking about the limit, you know, what determines something as sentient? Like I was saying, it's some form of integrated information, probably, but maybe more to it as well. I don't know the answer to that. Um, <clears throat> obviously, we have evolved, as I, I say as well, to have a certain specific kind of consciousness which serves our needs. But of course, that is, um, one has to understand that is a very biased way of looking at the world. So what we're missing is, <clears throat> well, you can't become another animal to know, can you? Unless, but that's why psychedelics are important, because they do then free the mind and we get at least the notion that there are other forms of consciousness out there, which then makes, you know, inspires us to find do they? Because <laughs> I feel some day, sometimes they make people feel really locked inside their heads. And well, even that is a form of consciousness, yeah. of course. You know, another form. Uh, you know, yeah, psychedelics aren't always pleasurable. I mean, that's what I always say when, you know, I always. Uh, I suppose you have more problem here in Sweden um, admitting to people that you take psychedelics because you live in such an authoritarian state. You know, but even compared, 
I don't want to go there, but... Um, yeah, we, we, it, we, it, nobody here <laughs> has ever done any drugs. But, so. Of course, yeah, and I, nor have I, I was just lying about it. But, <laughs> but I, um, in England, when I, um, when I say, uh, you know, when I want to sort of justify myself, I mean, people immediately, without knowing anything about it, will think, oh, it's just drugs, cocaine, it's like heroin, whatever, it's just for a rush. I always um, emphasise the academic, intellectual aspect of it, which it was, you know... It, if you look at um, Aldous Huxley, even people, William James and so on, it was an intellectual endeavor. This became a recreational thing in the mid-20th mid century, which then has now given it this negative connotation. But, you know, Thomas Metzinger, the great German philosopher, he was recently interviewed by Sam Harris, and he said, uh, Sam Harris asked him if, you had, if he had taken psychedelics, you know, and he, he said, well, you're asking me to admit a crime, you know, on radio, I'm not going to do that. But uh, he said something like this, you know, um, if you're a if you're a genuine consciousness researcher, you have to do the research. And he left it there. <laughs> so, so I think, um, you know, you can do philosophy of mind, psychology, cognitive science, whatever, without taking these things. But it's a bit like um, studying music without having listened to anything before the 20th century. You don't know what's available. Um, David Nuff, he was here once, right? Uh, he said, uh, if you want to understand consciousness, you've got to look at psychedelics. And so, it's becoming clear to people, I think, in, the, in academia um, that, yes, yeah, psychedelics now are offering a, a whole new field to explore these theories. That's partly what I'm talking about. And um, so the next step is to make them intellectually respectable. And this is, you're always faced with, like, um, I mean, I'm, in, I'm doubly in trouble because panpsychism is in the same state, you know? So I'm sort of pushing panpsychism and psychedelic research. But, um, you know, I think they're both uh, valid intellectual fields of inquiry. So this is, I guess that's why you're all here as well. So um, give yourself a round of applause. There you go. And uh, with that question of boundaries of consciousness, I think the boundary for the panel is also set. So thank you, everyone. Uh, and thank you, Robin, Jerry, and Hoji, and Edwin, Aron, and Peter, everyone. Talk about me or whatever, you know. It's so great. Oh,